Are you an activist? I remember the first time I was introduced as an activist. It took me aback a little bit. I thought, am I an activist? But when I searched the dictionaries for meaning of the word, I found one that suited me, so I'm wearing it. And this is it. An activist is an active, vigorous advocate for change. And I am an active and generally vigorous advocate for action on climate change. I'm passionate about it. Is there something you're passionate about? Something, some way that you want the world to be better and you're actively working for it? If so, in my book, you're an activist too. And welcome to the club. The thing about all that activity and all that vigor is that it takes a lot of energy. And this year, 2020, has been a very energy-draining year. Am I right? I mean, we started off looking for masks to protect ourselves from toxic bushfire smoke, and then two or three months later, we were looking for masks to protect ourselves and others from the coronavirus. At times, I found it overwhelming. And that affected my ability to be vigorous and active for what I was passionate about. But I learned something in 2020, and I'm going to talk about that today in the hopes that maybe it might help you too. And to tell part of my story, we're going to have to go back in time. So I want you to go back to roundabout New Year's Day, 2020. Even before I get out of bed, I am doom-scrolling through all the bad news on the internet. I reload the Fires Near Me app about every 10 minutes and watch that grim progress of the fires across Southeast Australia. The firefighters are exhausted and many of them don't have proper protection equipment. Some of them die. Millions of hectares are burning. Billions of animals are perishing. And I'm totally helpless to do anything about it. The smoke is now inside my house for days. My mind's eye replays that image of Australians trapped by the blazes right up against the ocean, between the ocean and an orange sky. And it's not clear who will help them. I have a friend from the coast She's evacuating, first from one center, then to another. Finally, she comes to Canberra to spend one quick night with me. One quick night, because even in Canberra, the nation's capital, she didn't feel safe. And she fled again. And then, I fell off the deck and broke my leg. And as I was practicing getting to the car with my wheelchair and my go bag, in case I had to evacuate, I thought about, what about all those people with permanent disabilities? Who's helping them with their evacuation plans? Now, through this time, I'm still working, but then, COVID hit, and it slowed the work dramatically, as well as raising new struggles. Struggles that now I and you had to face in physical isolation. So for me, it was just me and my sturdy Welsh terrier. I received news from the United States 
that my sister and her husband had contracted COVID-19. And I am half a globe away from them, totally unable to assist in any way. And throughout all of it, Twitter, Twitter is full of dangerous rhetoric, tearing my birth country apart into blue states and red states. And racial hatred is running down the streets. I collapsed. My body made the decision for me. For many days, I didn't get out of bed. I was in mourning. Mourning is a form of connection. In fact, you can't mourn unless you're deeply connected to something, something you care very, very much about and you've lost. And what I needed to do was mourn. Mourn for what had been lost in Black Summer, some of it perhaps permanently. The psychologists have a name for it. They call it radical acceptance, which is a reconnection to what's real in the past and in the present. And that's what I needed to do. I needed to radically accept where we were then, where I was then. Because in order to get where I want to go, I have to start from where I am. It's the only way to get there. Now, as the fires gradually became more and more extinguished, I found I could start again an activity that I love doing, which is going out in nature with my sturdy Welsh Terrier. And like all dogs, she spends her time in the moment. The sounds, the sights, and for her especially the smells. And walking with her, I began to do the same. I began to pay attention to the little things in the here and now, the things that gave me pleasure on a small scale, day to day, the things that were very familiar to me. Walking in nature does that for me. For you, it might be different. Maybe, maybe listening to music or, or doing some sport. Something that demands your attention right now centers you, grounds you. If I don't center myself, I'll be like a lopsided piece of clay on the potter's wheel. And as it begins to spin and the pressure builds, I find myself wobbling and wobbling. And centering is always the beginning of a good pot, my teacher told me. And centering is connection to yourself, reconnection to yourself. So that was my second step in this cycle of reconnection that I found myself on. And as I became more self-aware, I asked myself, why did your energy drain? And one reason I found is because I was trying to do things that were not directly related to my passion or my expertise. They were things I cared about very deeply, but they were things that took more energy from me than I could give, and so I found them draining. If in order to make room, make space for my own passion, I had to declutter. And so what that meant for me was that some requests that came in through email were declined. And I simplified my calendar, and I committed to myself that I was going to spend my energy where my passion was. And so that led me to the third step which I call decluttering. And this is also reconnecting. It's reconnecting to your passion, reconnecting with focus to your cause. Now, it happens that 
I have a little voice, a little internal voice that only I can hear, um, that I call unhelpful guilt. And unhelpful guilt was whispering to me in my ear, saying, oh, you could do more. You could do more, Penny. You should do more. I mean, there's so many ways that the world could be better, so many things you could be working on. And indeed there are. Indeed there are. It could be overwhelming. But then, a sort of realization came to me that all of these things, all of your passions, my passions, all of the ills and the struggles of the world are likely rooted in the same false belief. The false belief that we are separate, that we are apart from what is just outside, just outside us, ourselves, just outside our culture, our country, or outside our own species. Climate change, for example, is caused by the false belief that what we do, our actions, are disconnected, separate, from the Earth's biophysical and chemical systems that control the climate. Prejudice is based on the false belief that somehow we are separate from people that look different than we do or have speak a different language, despite the fact that our histories have intertwined and we are interdependent on one another, despite the fact that, frankly, our DNA is the same. And extreme wealth disparity thrives on the false belief that the extreme wealth of few is separate from, disconnected from, the labor and the sacrifices of many. Now, if this is true, and if all those struggles and all those ills are somehow rooted in this false belief of disconnection, then we can heal by radically accepting that we're connected. And every little reconnection anywhere, starts to heal in a small way the whole. And what that means is that I don't have to work on every struggle that I could think of, because some of you are doing that for me. And you can count on me to be passionately advocating for action on climate change. That's what I'll be doing. So, this cycle of reconnection. I call it a cycle because if my experience is any guide, you may find yourself traveling this more than once. I'm not standing here talking to you because I'm good at this. I'm not standing here because I've found the enlightenment. I'm standing here because I have been through this cycle more than once, many times. But each time, I find myself just a little bit stronger than I was the time before because of my previous experience. I now know that I need to take time to grieve when I need to grieve, to radically accept something that I may not want to believe is true, but in my heart, I know it is. And I now know that even in times of isolation, I can do valuable work by centering myself, which is probably my most valuable asset. And I've seen how my work can be more effective when I declutter. I can see that. I know it has power. I know that's something I need to do. And opening out becomes easier and easier 
each time I go through the cycle, each time I connect with others, trusting their work, seeing how my work can build on theirs, and theirs can build on mine. Opening out is the fourth stage of reconnection. It's when you realize that your work is connected to others. So when I realize that climate change is connected to environmental destruction, it is connected to the plight of refugees, that makes me more determined, more energetic. It makes me realize the value of my work. And when I reach out to other activists, I can learn from them. I can learn how climate action can help create fairer work and pay for everyone, how it can help those that are the most vulnerable, how it can use and respect the knowledge of First Nation peoples. My struggle is connected to all those struggles. Opening out is about reconnecting with the whole. Now, if you found that there were times during this year when your energy was draining, and maybe you felt the weight on your shoulders was just a little bit more than you could bear, then I invite you now to just take a moment and think about where you might sit at this moment on that cycle of reconnection. You know, as wicked and horrendous as the effects of COVID-19 have been, that it has been a vivid reminder to us that each of our lives is intimately interconnected with every other life on the planet. Now, that interconnectivity might make the virus spread faster, but it can also make ideas spread faster. And so what I'd like to do is leave you with this idea to take with you and use in your activism or in your life as you see fit. And the idea is this. Reconnecting is the very best thing that an activist, an activist like me, can do. The best thing for me, the best thing for my cause, and the best thing for all the causes and all the struggles of the world. Why? Because, in fact, they're all the same struggle. The same struggle to reconnect. And connection makes us stronger. <laughs>